Hi, everybody. This is the National Security Decision Making Game, and we're going to talk about our 30 years of mega gaming lessons, nuts, and bolts. Uh, this is being uh, broadcast for online mega gaming con, and we hope that you're all having a wonderful time. And I'm going to pass uh, the baton to Mark. Hi, my name is Mark McDonough. I'm co founder of the National Security Decision Making Game. We've been running this for about 30 years now. Uh, and we're, we'll be talking about some of our history, what our design philosophy is, and where we are, where we're going. Thanks. Please continue, Merle. <laughs> Bear with us. You trying to do this from, from Google, Merle? The, the joy of screen management, yes. So... Uh, we're a not-for-profit educational group devoted to understanding how world decisions are made. We also are devoted to sharing things we learned along the way. We've got a lot of people with military, government, academic, and business experience, and all our stuff's based on public information, so there's no secrets. All the things we mess up in these are our mistakes, and our employers don't know we're here, and they don't care. Uh, uh, we do a variety of games and seminars. We do... Uh, uh, six to eight and ten hour games, which we call our mega games and have been using that terminology for a number of years, our four hour fast play games. Uh, we cover contemporary Cold War and, and near future periods. And we do short games, both our crisis games and our doomsday games. And we do a whole bunch of seminars on things we learned along the way, including science fiction and other fun topics. Um, we're basically a live action role play game with the world as you know it. Our players represent unique groups with common interests that exist in the real world, and most are part of a specific real nation, and they operate domestically and internationally. They work in national cells but have individual agendas, and all nations have unique mechanics um, that simulate their processes. Our play focuses on actions and initiatives taken by players. So what do we do? Well, we do the contemporary, the 1960s Cold War and experimental games, our standard games are contemporary, 1960s, near future, and doomsday. How many games have we run? Uh, over 500 myself, and I think Mark's done over six. Um, most years we run at least 18 games. Some years we run 25. We've also done experimental games in a variety of areas, and under development we're doing 1983 Cold War games and sort of European-style mega games in our near future. And now you have finally posted us to the OMGCon site, so they will start seeing stuff. These are the places we normally show up. This year, in particular, you're going to see us at um, the Museum of Science Fiction's Escape Velocity Convention, and you can find us on Facebook and on YouTube. Those are our locations. So, our journey, Mark. Uh, yeah, well, this uh, all started, to the, you, you see in the center my brother Dan, we lost him in uh, 2016. On the uh, right side there is the U.S. Naval War College where this essentially originated when Dan was on staff there and I was in the Navy Reserve supporting. Next slide. Uh, yeah, we uh, at uh, the, the uh, Origins 1990 convention, and uh, the Origins used to be a convention to move from city to city, piggybacking on another convention. It was considered the national national war gaming convention, and in 1990 it was at uh, in Atlanta at Dragon Con. Um, a man named Lou Zaki, who is uh, very important in the uh, Game Manufacturers Association, offered to contact the various military war colleges and bring people in in order to have them lecture on what government wargaming is, what the military does with wargaming in a professional sense, what we, they, how we do it, what we get out of it. Next slide. Yeah, that ended up on the desk of my brother, Dan, uh, in 1990. He was, he was actually head of the wargame club in the Navy War College wargame department. So they said, oh, we'll give it to him besides he's lieutenant commander. So he's a, a small little jobs officer and hand it off to him. He offered, in addition to giving uh, lectures on wargaming, to put on a demonstration game, to try to show what a military war game is like, uh, civilianized, scaled down so it could be run in an eight-hour period. His lectures were wildly popular. He's a very dynamic speaker, and people really enjoyed listening to the, to the stories he told of his time in the service. And word of mouth grew, and his uh, audiences got larger and larger, and uh, Dragon Con had to move us to larger and larger rooms to accommodate him. And the first game we gave was on the uh, first day 
uh, which I believe was Thursday on that at that convention, and it was so popular that uh, the uh, folks, uh, players, said, "Let's do this again." And the convention scheduled uh, impromptu scheduled another game on Saturday by popular demand. Next slide. Now, what we did uh, to Dan and to me, uh, he had me play test it before we tried this. He play tested it a couple of times at the uh, Naval War College. Uh, but what you know, he saw it as is a game of discussing national priorities, national. Um, uh, security decisions, making decisions on policy and budget, and any military operations, crises, whatever, were merely a background or to frame a discussion by the decision makers and what they need to procure what issue, uh, what uh, their policy decisions are, are going to be. So uh, as a template, he used an Axis and Allies style rules, a policy and budget sheet, which was the NSDM move. Uh, the players actually used their, and the, uh, used their, um, uh, techniques to, in a political sense, to try to determine what they're going to spend money on. They use that to buy units the way someone would in Axis and Allies, in which they would then handle, attempt to handle the world's problems, which were a background. There was a green cell. We put players in the U.S. cell and the US Soviet cell. Remember, it's 1990. There was still a Soviet Union. She was getting smaller, but there was still a Soviet Union, still a superpower condition. And the rest of the players were put in a green cell. Every country on the world, and some were stylized. Um, you would put com various countries together in one if they're large, if they're similar. But um, uh, we're, we're played by a green cell, and their instructions were to try to uh, generate issues that the superpowers had to uh, respond to. You know, Dan had to ask them halfway through the game, cool it down, because they were doing too good a job creating issues for the superpowers to respond to. Now, remember the time we were, period we're in. It was 1990. The Berlin Wall had come down a few years ago. The Soviet Union was clearly decaying. The superpower struggle that it characterized the last 40 years was fading into uh, uh, fading into history. Uh, the U.S. military had been rebuilt from the Vietnam era. Uh, was an era where we just had successful interventions in Grenada and Panama. It's pre-Desert Storm, so the entire uh, feel for post-Cold War interventionism and precision-guided weapons and the U.S. performing these coalitions, uh, none of that, none of that really was in existence at that point. Uh, next slide. Okay, so some pictures. By 1997, I'm I'm still wearing a uniform, but Dan's at this point retired, so he's in civil in civvies, and we were making uh, these T-shirts. We uh, NSCM specialized T-shirts, which we could sell, offset some of our expenses because we didn't get a dime from the government to go to these uh, these sites. By 1997, I don't think anybody in the government remembered who uh, that uh, we were there or cared one way or another. Um, this is Origins, and Dan and my brother Dan in the middle giving a lecture. Next. This is our control staff as of 1998. Uh, a certain number of these people are still with us, in fact. Um, some some have gone gone in their own directions, but we're still in touch with, with uh, all of them. Next slide. My brother and me uh, dressed up to do connections in the year 2000. We were some of the first people in the gaming community at these conventions to get radio headsets to help communicate. And my brother, I, I, got, I brought them to the convention and said, these are way cool. Uh, next slide. And just some more gratuitous pictures of Origins, uh, Origins, Gen Con, and Dragon Con are the three big things that we do, have been doing routinely every year. This is, this is Dragon Con. We've been expanding larger and larger into Dragon Con in the last few years. So now okay. we're going to talk about the philosophy of NSDM and how we do things. Um, the roots of NSDM, of course, are in the Naval War College because both Mark and Dan were working there when they started the game at Dragon Con. And basically what we try to do is design with the end in mind, what audience we have, what group that we're trying to deal with, and what things we're trying to simulate. And this is a lot more complicated chart than you need to see, but it gives you an idea of how we look at when we're modeling, how much time it takes to do it, what kind of tools the players need, and what our sponsor, whether it's the convention or the player base, is has as an issue. Um, basically, our goal is to explore how real politic works with different nations, cultures, governmental systems, and situations, and try to use real relationships and simulate logical results. Our games are designed, and all the only countries that we design games for are ones that have internal and external tension, allow significant player decisions, and we can teach in the game time limits. We also have set them up so that we can play them with variable player turnout, and they have to be fun, because if they're not fun, nobody's going to want to play. 
Our, our ideal goal in this is to simulate reality. And the things we feel we do well after 30 years of doing this are modeling the feel of countries, giving people a good sense of the circumstances and choices they have in different nations. And we do this effectively, we think, because we do lots of research and education, and we have a lot of experience running games. The one thing we do really poorly, though, is simulating culture, because we run with a bunch of Americans, and it's very hard to get them to feel like they're Indonesians or Turks or Russians with the kind of background that you need to do that. Uh, what goes into design? Well, the attribute of our games and our design goals are multiple. We have various aims and objectives, which are to get real politic into the game. We want to model the domestic and international issues. We want to see that players have real decisions to make and that we're simulating diplomatic information, military and economic events. So we try to model national processes in a simple enough way to be run in the duration of the games. We use our expert knowledge to make decisions about uh, the effectiveness of pl different player actions. And our personal research is what gives us the data and resources to do it well. We also have a lot of staff, IT support, maps, and play aids. And we'll show examples of those as we move further into the presentation. You know, one of the important things that we have to do in the whole process is take into account the balance between simulation and playability. You know, simulation and trying to get it accurate takes a lot of time and education and analysis. You do a lot of things to boil your tools down and make them easy to use, but your real underlying issue is it has to be playable. So it has to be something you can teach in the time constraints and educate the players to play. You also have to have um, a sort of a balance between the insights you think you're going to provide to people versus the investment. Because if you get bad information in, you get bad information out. So basically, the kinds of things you talk about from a military's perspective is there are a number of different groups you look at. And we try to consider these in all of our games in terms of how we design, in terms of the kinds of players. So normally you talk about the blue and red teams, good guys versus bad guys, but there are other elements that in some countries and nations are important to include. Sometimes you need electoral issues and political parties, which is like the populace. You need criminal elements like the triads or the Yakuza or whatever. Uh, you sometimes need non-governmental organizations. So all those kinds of things we look at. One of the other things that we do is we try to figure the critical levels for different things. So all of our cells are designed to run at various staffing levels. They run at what we call A, B, C, and D staffing levels. And essentially the idea is to get the kind of dynamic you need in some cells you need seven players, and some cells you need nine as a starting point. And then you can expand that to add additional groups and and components. Um, the whole goal is to generate synthetic experience for the players through role play. So the game becomes very visceral and it has an impact on memory and learning. We basically try to under help people understand the probable, the possible, the plausible, and in some cases the ridiculous because we have run some science fiction and future games and give them an ability to experiment with choices that generate insights, not lessons. So one of the key things that comes from our military-related background is the realization that war games do not prove anything. They are designed to give you insight into relationships. Uh, audience differences at our different sites do impact how that works. Uh, we've had a lot of change in the age cohort of people that play in our games. Uh, back in the 90s, we had a lot of veterans. We did almost no veterans in play now. Uh, we have a lot more cost players in play. It affects how things work. And you know, all, all of the result is trying to give a psychological impact to people for them to understand better how other countries work. Uh, now, in our games, we also build in story arcs. Now, one thing to understand is our games are designed that there is no inevitable future. We do have some major themes that we try to explore in every game. In some games, it's mechanization or the, the uh, impact of particular technologies. Sometimes it's a change in international affairs. And those are things that we build as a major arc, but essentially the players can influence it. So if China's falling apart and they do things to stabilize China, they can make it work. Uh, that's always an opportunity. And we try to make it plausible and real. You know, we make those major story arcs before the game and then during the game based on the players' actions, our staff has enough experience that we generate minor things that might be of interest, like a freighter sinking, uh, inter air interception issue, something like that. It's definitely a free play structure game 
where all story arcs are modified by play. Uh, we also affect the way we operate based on the venue we're in. We do games at academic venues where we try to be very academic and we try to limit the really exotic things from happening. Uh, we also do things at conventions, which are various varieties, historical conventions like Origins started out as, role play conventions like the focus at Gen Con and sci-fi and, and modern technology stuff is just exemplified by Dragon Con. Uh, we got a significant number of repeat customers and we've had a number of people played in 70 or more of our games. Uh, regulars tend to help train new players because the basic mechanics of our countries uh, have a lot of commonality and they're things they can learn from game to game. Uh, essentially what NSDM has become is a fusion of professional and gamer technologies and approach. So some of the things that we picked up from the gaming world is time distortion. Players need choices and consequences, so what that means is there are ways that we manipulate time so that players have time to make those choices and they have uh, an ability to see in the game consequences. So the cycle time for things to happen is something we're very cognizant of. If it takes somebody so long to negotiate something, the clock on the game may slow to months instead of years in a half an hour period. Most of our games tend to represent five to seven years of real time, but that varies widely because we're trying to let the players enjoy what's going on. We also exaggerate research and development because research and development, it takes you 10 to 15 years to field an aircraft carrier, but if they want to fund one, we try to see that it arrives during the course of the game if they do it early enough. Um, the other thing that we've, we've learned with gamer technology is how to manage players, making choices tangible. So a lot of players have very wild ideas of the thing they want to do, and we try to say, well, why don't we tie this down to one part of the initiative so that we can give you a clear result? So our staff helps structure unstructured ideas, and we try to allow for drama and then story narrative that you get out of gameplay. We also used our news feeds for fun, and we'll show an example of our news feeds later on. Um, so when we talk about story arcs, that all revolves around the military approach to a master scenario in list where we try to simulate play by having key things change from the world as you know it. That adds flavor and a sense of realism, but we let the players drive. Player actions impact everything. Um, the other thing is that variable staffing flexibility that I talked about allows us to do a number of things. Internal to cells, you have to realize as you design people who are political versus executive and, and uh, administrative the kind of accuracy we want and whether they're gonna be players that are marginalized. So sometimes we will modify a little bit from reality so there are no marginalized players. Um, we also try to see that there are positions that have advocacy. You know, as they have clear and useful choices to make. So one of the other things when we talk about the staffing levels like the A, B, C, and D, we try to look at big cells versus small cells. Um, you know, what kind of adversaries are involved and what size groups are required. One of the key things that we've learned is generally you don't want an even number of people in a cell because if you do, they tend to deadlock decisions. So how our games work. Um, so in general, we, we follow this kind of a setup. We have a command group, as you can see on the right, which is the MILCON and the people that run the thread control and the, and the measles, the, the scenario inserts. We also have somebody running the military map. We have a news, world feed, which is normally up on a big projection screen so everybody sees it. We have a game director that moves around to make sure the pace of the game is sufficient and the players are busy and not too busy because what we do with our injects is, is weigh those in terms of when they're gonna come into play based on uh, player activity. We also have a series of staffers that represent the rest of the world. So for example, there'll be a facilitator that represents the United Nations, facilitator that represents the large countries that aren't in play and then each one of the players cells and we call them cells because they're not teams they're nation states in our game but they're not teams because every player is out for themselves you know so what is the game about you know we're a seminar game and a live action role play game where our judges simulate the non-player forces groups and events we're basically focused on entertainment and education, and it's all about how nations defend their influence, people, prosperity, institutions, security, and economy. That's the focus of the game. And what NSDM does is it demonstrates relationships. It demonstrates how national policy, politics, and diplomacy interact, and basically how people spend all that money. 
the structure of our games are, that we start out with an in-game briefing. The in-game briefing basically talks about um, game mechanics, the world background, positions that are signed, how, and then we group people into their cells, national sets, give them the background as, as a shorter briefing, talk about what goes on in cell mechanics, let them introduce themselves, and then we release them into the wild to interact with one another. At the end of the game, sometimes we've had promotional items such as t-shirts and mugs that we've sold, but essentially it's the debrief. It's what we call the excuse generation phase or the mutual recrimination phase or the what on earth were you thinking phase where we ask them why they did those crazy things. And that's one of the high points of play. Um, the way our staff is set up, I mentioned before, we have a general overall game director. We have military and economic controllers, facilitators, cell controllers, and players. Basically, the roles are very simple. The game directors to see that people have a good time and they're busy enough and not too busy. The Milcon of controls military action, which is a sub part of the game. Uh, the facilitators act as your staff for advice and information. The cell controllers administer national activities like elections or fake elections, depending on your country. And the players work to advance their goals. Players represent cones of thousands of people in our game. It is designed so that they are representing large groups. So in our game, assassinations are disruptive, but not game ending. Players don't get eliminated. Uh, there are two kinds of things in our games. There are uh, fixed roles, which like if you're a branch of a political party or if you're uh, a particular social group, those are fixed. You have positions like president or prime minister that can move around. Each one of those has a cone of people and responsibilities and capabilities. Uh, all of them are like-minded people with similar interests. Player interactions. National processes are one of the things we focus on to give you the feel for each country. Um, sometimes it's political parties, sometimes it's factions, they're different structures, but essentially what we're trying to do is simulate the tension that goes on in the real country. And often our games circulate around the issue of the rule of law versus the rule of men because People in some countries are very dictatorial and very uh, decree-oriented, and others do legislation. So we have different models for democracies, oligarchies, and dictatorships. The level of detail that we have to think about in every, in, in every one of our games, and we periodically redesign, is the level of detail we want to have for political campaigns to simulate or simplify them and how we handle budgets, because budgets and economics is one of the things in our long games we focus on and our shorter games we've had to sacrifice a lot of. Uh, game results basically are like this. When a player is doing something, it's a basically your cells action, other cells actions, individual actions, agreements, plans, and the game threads that all interact to give you results. And that can be reflected in getting more votes or versatility or capability. Um, this is an example of some of our maps and our news feed. Uh, this shows how we did this. This is 2019. And we'll start to take a couple questions here in a minute. But the real secret sauce in how NSDM has been around so long and so successful is core staff experience. About 20% of our staff have over 30 years of experience. Another 20% about 10 years. And the remainder drag off from 10 to, to 0. We have a few new additions. But the key is not our software or our hardware, it's the staff expertise. It's the fact we have serious background and knowledge of the events that we're simulating, because for modern things, we're news hounds, and for uh, Cold War things, we were all trained in this through work or school. Uh, we also have a lot of teamwork and experience working as a team. So we'll talk next about the evolution over time, but I want to take a couple of questions. We had one question from Leslie about do you make recommendations on background knowledge that's helpful in playing the games? Um, and the answer is you don't have to know anything. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but essentially we turn our staff into your staff. So we have people that come in totally ignorant of events and people that come in informed. Being informed helps, but being informed does not, is not the be all end all. We also have a question from Discord, uh, what do y'all do to help your control team to get ready for a game? And over the years, what have you learned is essential? Well, we do annual meetings where we get together for a weekend and we stay in regular communication and do uh, video and audio conferences every couple of months as we work on updates to current designs uh, because most of these countries are really kind of pesky because they have their own elections and change leaders and things like that. 
Um, you also say that you see a variety of strategies. Here are the rules, read them the day before. Uh, we, we basically brief it in the game. Most of our games now are four hours. We have about a 15 minute in brief that talks about how NSDM works and how the basic structure of games are. And then when you go to your individual countries, there's a five to 10 minute brief that talks about a little bit of the history and current events. And we have generally do what I call the one minute teaching moment. So if an issue comes up that we haven't covered in the briefings, we have everybody gather together that's impacted and give them a one or two minute briefing on the basics of how that works. Um, also, they said, how, what do you think new groups should do to build up controllers? The biggest thing that we do is we find people who are enthusiastic uh, and excited and recruit them into the team and then start them out as facilitators. And then over time, they learn more and more of the game mechanics in the process. Um, there's also a question from Lee on what do you think of administrative software that are being developed to assist in running mega games? Um, we do have some aids. Uh, at one time, we used an economic model, but we found that it was too traditional in its approach, and we left that aside. We do have a lot of things that we do behind the scenes to help simplify the player aids. But the big things that we've automated uh, are our news feed, so you no longer have to shout to players what's going on or walk to every cell. Um, we also have implemented the maps because we had one enthusiastic player that came in and said, this is, is not enough. And we'll show you examples of our own old maps with post-its and phone core uh, as a comparison to the modern ones. And we can call up a screen on that in a little bit. Okay, so Mark, evolution over time. Okay, uh, as we said, we've been doing this for 30 years. We've reinvented ourselves a few times along the way. Uh, trying to keep up first with what we perceive the players want uh, and second to try to perceive with how society is changing, how they're looking for different things and how the technology is evolving to try to help us improve on things. Next. As we pointed out, we started out in 1990, Dragon Con, <clears throat> Origins 1990. Uh, we started, uh, brought into Gen Con in 1992. Uh, these are simple mechanics, as I said, based on access and allies rules as a background to uh, force players to start discussing issues and policy for their their cells. It was contemporary, a U.S., a Soviet cell, a green cell doing everything else. Through 1995, we started to evolve. Dan was adding a, a new nation every year. I look forward to saying, yeah, what, what country are we going to be able to model this year? Um, adding new roles. Uh, we started to develop a permanent staff in 1995, a bunch of our most committed followers and fans that we could count on for every uh, every game, to, and we'd, we'd pull out of the crowd to help us facilitate. Um, I suggested to Dan, maybe we could convince, convince the convention that's bringing us in to give us hotel rooms for all these guys and free badges, and we started to build a permanent staff out of that. We we're improving the policy and budget sheets uh, to give more flexibility and more accuracy to uh, the more better feel. Now, now that we developed from the access and high uh, rules, we evolved into a free form mechanic where uh, instead of a map that you move pieces on, we just put up a real world map and we start to put up different units and discuss the possibility of what the real units are, what they could do, how far they would travel. There's a difference between tactical and operational strategic scales. We have to kind of skirt, bo skirt all of those. Uh, um, so we can't, uh, you know, in the time it might take the United States to discuss the policy issue is you know, 20 times the time it would take to fly a plane from here to there and do something about it. Uh, so in addition to that, we're adding, adding on to the venues. We we're, were brought into Dragon Con at some point along that, uh, that timeline. We were also started to work out at HMGS conventions. Uh, throughout the late 1990s, it still remained a U.S. centric game. We had, it was, I think, in 1998 until we ran a game that didn't have the U.S. as one of the cells involved. And it was the, strictly the numbers of people we had turning out for that convention made, made, that, made me make, force that choice. Um, and uh, we, our games, especially at Gen Con, were blowing up. We were getting up to 80 people in one game. Um, my, my, na my name was on the cover of that uh, Gen Con book. Not that I, I was that great. I think I fooled them about how good I was. But uh, the the, um, the advertisement we're getting brought us uh, larger and larger groups of people. And NSDM is a better game with more people, more cells in play, you know, more interactions and more things happening. Uh, we started to get build a web presence at that time. Our military aids began to evolve 
uh, we started to went from large from large uh, maps that we put up on the wall to foam boards, and we'll go into that later. We uh, toward the late 90s, we started to have problems with the various conventions advertising us properly. The advertising dried up. Usually, it became um, insignificant in some cases. We started to put up our own large posters. We were some of the first uh, groups that actually make their own posters and put them up. And the uh, one one of the things that I worked on fairly hard was the economic modeling. The uh, a, a nation cell in our game would feel that they succeeded or did not succeed for a turn based on how what how, how we model their gross domestic product GDP growth. And I have no Excel spreadsheet that I used to put their policy and budget decisions in and gave them a GDP number, rise and fall. That also gave, and if it rose, they gave them more money to spend and to help fund their projects. Next slide. So going into the 21st century, uh, it would take me a, a half a convention to get the maps up with all the military units. We were using post-it uh, post glue on the backs of, of various markers I made. Uh, we went to foam core maps that were three foot by four foot. Two of them uh, put uh, were a map of the map, a highly detailed map of the world from Iceland to in the upper left to Darwin in the lower right. And we started to use regular post-its and print unit markers directly on that. And when the convention ended, I folded it up, taped it, and was ready to go for next time. It made things very, very quickly. Um, at that point, we started to get a lot of player feedback. Our games were universally eight hours long, and our typical convention was three eight-hour games. Uh, we were getting a lot of feedback, and that was an awful lot of time for someone to commit to one of our games, and we should try... At some point, we, we initially wanted to, the initial plan was to put a four-hour game, which was a demonstration game. So that slowly evolved, and, and Merle at that point was uh, stepping up to take a uh, major role in lead design, and he said, I'll design a four-hour NSDM version that will run very quickly. Now, with the various things we were doing with policy and budget sheets, economic modeling, these maps, it was a, a game that tended to run very long. But Merle figured out how to try to streamline it, and we're still looking for techniques to streamline it. But right now, our, the four-hour game is our principal game. We haven't run a game longer than that in a year or two. Um, in the mid, uh, about 2004, 2005, we started to develop gigabucks. The budgets on uh, different, different nations all said, okay, what percentage of your budget are you spending on this? What percentage of your budget are you spending on that? And that didn't... Um, lend itself very well to international relations and trade because 1% of the U.S. budget is a huge fraction of the Iranian budget. How do they talk to each other in terms of what this thing costs? and how? So we, we so settled on a, a gigabuck as a unit of measure, a unit of, um, of, of money and influence that will carry across the different nations. The, the different nations that work pretty well. Well, they also have we have used it also to generate influence. Money and influence can be considered the same thing in some on some levels. At that point, we also started to do uh, uh, develop our 19 early 1960s Cold War game. Dan had committed to doing that. We had always said we didn't want to do a uh, an historical convention, a historical variant. Uh, we weren't going to do it, we weren't going to do it, and then suddenly Dan made a commitment and said, Mark, we need to do this, so make it. So, okay, so I started to try to make our first version of the 1960s Cold War game, and that's also popular. It's not quite as popular with the conventions as our contemporary, but it's got its own following, and it has its own, uh, enjoys in its own right. Um, and we had a, put a, started to put out a new standard for player cards, uh, tr again, just trying to streamline so we can hand out these the hand out cards and get the game going in 15 minutes when it usually literally took sometimes an hour and a half of in briefing and uh, rack and stack of player to position to get a game going. Uh, you can't spend an hour and a half doing that if the whole game is four hours and we want at least a half hour debrief. At that point, we also started to do experiment with um, what Merle calls the experimental games, our, our Civil War or U.S. secession crisis game. Uh, which is designed to run in two hours, uh, seven, I think seven people, uh, with by, uh, seven players by, with two staff members continuing to make injects. And the, uh, the background of that game is that uh, Abraham Lincoln has been, uh, elected and it's now five months out to his inauguration. And can these different factions in the U.S. body politic come to an agreement that will avoid a civil war? We ran it four or five times. They never did. Uh, we developed from that into the, our World War One game, 
the various great powers in Europe. It's now, it's, I call it the games of August, but are you, are they able to avoid a great conflict as well? I'm not sure they ever did either. Uh, moving on toward into, back into the, in the new century, um, we got featured as a, a pinnacle event in the, the 2007 Gen Con anniversary book. Uh, Dan, my brother Dan, began to have medical issues, uh, dementia, and he, he dropped dead. His last games were in 2008. Um, at that point, we were developing an improved, our improved improvements to our Cold War, improvements to our China cell, our uh, Israel cell we're incorporating into the Cold War, uh, and uh, updating various various other nations, France and Turkey, which are actually player favorites today. And 2010 was a really big year for us. Uh, we did a game at the National Defense University, and these are these are professional gamers. They wanted to see us in because they saw us doing dynamic gaming. They saw us reacting to the major player inputs and major player directions and shifting the whole game around and taking it in a new direction. They didn't know how to do that. Government gaming, the game, whole game is scheduled with this is what we expect to happen, this move, and sure, the players will discuss this, discuss that, but the next move, the discussion of the next move is already in the can and they know exactly where the game is going to go. So dynamic gaming is something they didn't know. They wanted to see us do it. Marine Corps intelligence activity brought us in a couple of times as a training event to cap a leadership uh, conference, a uh, leadership course they had. Um, we're working on the different, trying to get the policy and budget sheets uh, stable, stabilized and, and enjoyable. It's usually rather tedious and slow work for the players. They didn't enjoy it a whole lot. Uh, but so we're trying, we're doing, we are trying and still doing everything we can to try to make the, try to reincorporate economic play. We've largely dropped it in the last few years, but it's, it's, we're trying to get back to it, especially in longer games. Next slide. Okay. Uh, the big maps I was bringing around were getting tedious and they were, they were, they actually are not, you, you, I could set up in one place and they had to be in the one place and, with an NSDM game that's played across three or four different rooms, different cells in each room, that wasn't optimum anymore. So one of our more uh, ambitious and uh, intellectual and uh, IT savvy pers uh, person started to develop the, our map tool. So our mill map tool, we all show it. We have an example later, but it has the, all the military units, the entire world. We actually have uh, different different campaigns, different variants for contemporary for the Cold War, specialized map for the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, a map for our World War One game, and it's very flexible. It's net, fully networked, and we'll talk more about that later. Integrated with that, with our with our news feed, that's also integrated across multiple rooms. We can uh, sit down at a terminal, tap in a news inject or a, a item out of the measles list, and it will broadcast on all of the channels in every room simultaneously. And that beat a lot of what we're doing, which was stepping in, having a runner step into the room and yell out what the current news is. And in 2013, we actually started to get our, put together our Cuban Missile Crisis two-hour simulation. That's become one of our crisis favorites. Um, I took a look at what our, my two colleagues had done with the Civil War game with a series of positions, and this is the, your situation, and these are injects that they kept throwing at them every few minutes, try to keep the pressure up. And I, I worked with, with another of our, our team, Pete Rocco, to say that we can use that same basic format and, and model a Cuban Missile Crisis. And that's become one of our uh, one of our staples right now. It's like the only thing we've been able to figure out how to do online are those very interactive person-to-person -person game. Uh, we have other additional crises games, and as mentioned before, those are focused on um, events in action rather than uh, in a two-hour format with a lot of in uh, injects and a scenario-heavy environment, which is a little different from our brand, which is generally, it's the world as you know, and now do something in it. Um, modifying roles and positions. Uh, our, we added a uh, United Kingdom cell to our Cold War 1960s, then a Cuban cell to our Cold War 1960s. And uh, the uh, last few years, we've redesigned our Chinese cell from the uh, the, the, cold, the Cold War era Russian cell redesign, which is what it was, and essentially the same thing we were running back in 1990 uh, with the Chinese influence, to a more uh, loose, freeform uh, superpower that, that it, we expect to be the U.S. peer competitor going, into, going forward. And that's become one of our more popular cells as well. Uh, last year, we began with our first, we rolled out our first uh, 
uh, Soviet cell uh, for, for our new Cold War period in, in the 1980s, which I, I was a little skeptical at first, but it seemed to work out very well. And this year, we would have put out a U.S. cell if we actually had had any conventions that didn't cancel or go, go entirely online. Um, this year, uh, we've done online work with the Discord server, uh, feeding our YouTube channel, the Facebook page, uh, and we're working on a new EU mega game. Next slide. Okay, were you going to do this or me? I can't remember. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover this one. All so right. this is our, our game today to give you a better sense of how things are working. Um, every player gets a, a player card, uh, and they have what we call the the uh, symbols, tokens, and, and icons of what they are. Their public uh, information that's available about them is on the front. This is a dummy card that we've only played once with a seven-year-old that came to the game. Uh, basically, this is the uh, Pakistan Premier League and the person in charge of promoting cricket. Uh, basically, the front of people's cards are public, and they wear them on their badges at a convention. And the back has all their secret powers, including this guy's secret power to get kick tickets to any cricket game in the world. So he doesn't want to tell everybody about that because he can't get them for everybody. But basically, on the backs, we have motivations, powers, resources, and knowledge. And those have become more sophisticated over time where we try to give them a basic hook as to what kinds of things they do and their player position. Uh, we have military maps that we use that are product of map tools, which is an open code source product that one of our guys has heavily modified. Um, and this is an example of what it looks like for our Cuban Missile Crisis game. We basically underlie things with real maps. We have uh, icons that get placed on to show aircraft and, and zones of fire and things like that. This has really upped our game because we went from the old phone core stuff, and we'll show you examples of those later, to these, and we put them on a great big yard projection screen that we carry to every convention. Um, the other thing in our game is we basically tell players you don't have to know world technology or world events to play our game. It helps, but it's not essential. Uh, we don't expect you to know everything. So our staff is your staff. On just about any topic that they're concerned about, we have somebody that knows something or is some form of expert. So they can come to the staff and say, what would my staff tell me I could look at for this? And we will give them choices that their staff would give them. They don't have to follow those. We're not trying to railroad anybody. But we also point out to them that staff, element, staff estimates can be wrong. If you're Hitler and you're invading the Soviet Union in 1941, everybody's going to tell you you're going to make it to Moscow. Outer Botswana does not get the same quality answer the United States does when you ask how many missiles does the Soviet Union or Russia have today because they don't have the intelligence assets. The other thing we tell them is we don't play against them. We're not trying to get an outcome. So what we're trying to do is help you have a good time in the game. Now, in our game, we do the same kinds of things that happen in the real world. You basically, to make things happen, you have to figure out what you want to do, why you want to do it, where you want to do it, how you want to do it, who's going to be involved, and what the result is. And we'll show you how we do manage that. We manage that primarily through action cards, which is this thing off on the left-hand side. But we also have other things that we provide to players. Sometimes we have national issues to prompt them to play. For example, uh, in the American cell, we might have a card that says, gun control is an issue. Here are the three major positions. Pick one and try to get a legislation passed on it. Uh, and the way they do that, pass legislation or make some kind of significant action, is with our action cards. The front of the card basically has it marked as to whether it's a trade deal and what people have agreed to help with it. And then there are a couple of blocks for our control staff. And on the back, they write freehand what they want to do. So if you're in a Cold War game, they might say, build an interstate highway system. And they take that to one of the staff and say, this is what I want to do. And the staff uh, facilitator or one of the primary controllers or the MILCON if it's military will say, you need the following kinds of resources. Three other players of this type, a player from the other country that's this kind, those kinds of things. And basically, especially because everybody doesn't have a lot of money in the game, okay, we basically know their relative strength and what they contrib can contribute. So we basically presume when the game starts, everybody has something equivalent to about 20% of their resources that's discretionary. And that is a simulation decision so that they can play and have choices. They don't have to automatically defund things. If they have something really big, and the interstate highway system is a good example, we say, what else are you going to do? You're going to raise taxes? 
You're going to cut some other program. What's going to be your process? And here's an example of what a plan is. Here's a classic. We're going to build a Death Star to crush the rebellion at the moons of Endor. We're going to use engineers from player five, mass taxation, secret material shipments, and all the players sign on that this is what they're doing. And the staff result could be, gee, the Rebel Alliance destroys it just before it's fully operational. What do you want to try next? Same as in the real world or in science fiction. Our game's core is negotiation between the players because everybody has a role and that role has a vision of the world. That vision of the world is what they're trying to convince everybody else the world should be. And through negotiation and asking intelligently, they basically convince people to do things. Sometimes wacky stuff happens. For example, in one game, we had the Japanese trying to get rid of radioactive soil from Fukushima. They had a Chinese company handle it, and the Chinese use it as fill in all those islands they're building in the South Pacific. Go figure. Um, now, in our longer games, we do policy and budget. And policy and budgets went through several evolutions. This is the current one. Um, we tend not to use this except as a benchmark for players to see <clears throat> how they're doing things in the real world. And we update these periodically. The important thing to understand here is the income block, the green is where money comes from, red is where money goes to, and blue is those things that have to do with policy. So for example, if I'm India, I'll talk about whether I want to be Hindu state or secular state. I'll talk about what percentage of resources and philosophy I put on military versus economic policy, that kind of stuff. Now, these, this is a more structured model than some of our earlier ones. Some of our earlier ones were a lot of fun. And you can do this in a sci-fi world, too. This is Sauron's policy and budget sheet. And you'll notice he has money set aside for the all-seeing eye. He has stuff on reputational changes. He had stuff on trade policy and defense. So this is something that's a framework that you can use in lots of different environments. So nowadays, we tend to use this a lot less. And the main reason we use it is we went to shorter games. Uh, our original model was we were running eight and 10 hour games. So you could spend 15 or 30 minutes with people working on a budget. But what happened with that is number one, they took a lot of time. They weren't a lot of fun. We found that some people just can't add, even if you give them a calculator and some help. Even the simple layouts would confuse people and they isolate some players from the flow of the game. So they'd go out there and we'd win the budget war and they'd have no involvement in the rest of the game, the stuff that's the most fun. So our solution was to give people that discretionary percentage fund managed by the staff and for large projects, force them to specify what they're going to defund or where they're going to get the money. And we buried it in adjudication. That's one of the things we want to move away from, but we haven't come up with a good mechanic. We've experimented again and again with models for that. And here are two of them. One thing we did was what we called gigabucks, where you had currency. And we found that people chased the money and it became a money game. That's not what we were trying to accomplish. We've also done influence tokens where it's like, this is the case of vodka that you give the Russian ambassador. And that convinces him to give you that little extra push for that last thing. That also meant that people started chasing those things as a primary goal, which wasn't the goal of what we were trying to simulate. Um, now, the way we handle adjudication, one of the things that's one of our watchwords is always keep in mind the unintended consequences. Players always are ignorant of what's going on in much of the rest of the world. That's the nature of the real world, too. But we also try to think about what's the thing that's going to be fun for the game that leads to that consequence. Not that you try to run them down a path, but you say, well, what didn't they think of? Uh, so what we try to do with our adjudication is have a realism baseline. And then the player staff advice helps them focus and refine their choices. And then the resource requirements are defined by the staff. And we, one of the big things we use as a control is determining how long it takes. For example, with the interstate highway example, that's going to take 10 years to complete, but we're going to give you partial results after two years of game time and more partial results after five years of game time so that you can see the consequences of your action. The guidelines we give the staff is players play with players, the staff reacts. Except for the big storyline items, we don't inject new stuff. We try to react to the way the nation states or groups that they approach are. So the facilitators not only rep replace nations, they replace factions in nations. So we tell people, if you want to talk to the terrorists in France, you go to the French controller. And he won't tell the French police who he also is unless he's supposed to know for some other reason. Um, you know, we also take into account when they're doing things, who else will learn of it and how they're going to learn it. So 
if you're working on a secret project and you're working with the Chinese and you're North Korea, there may not be a lot of people that know about it. But if you're the United States working on a secret project, historically, we're not that good at keeping secrets. There's some things we can do, some things we can't. So the other thing we take into account with adjudication is where we're playing the game and what it's for. If we're in an academic environment, we're very, very focused on plausible and real. Uh, most of our games at conventions on a loose version of the real world. Uh, when we do conventions at the fantasy conventions or the sci-fi conventions, we move from, from that into plausible and fantastic sometimes because we have run a Star Trek-like sci-fi game at Dragon Con. We have run uh, situations where the whole world's ice caps have melted and you have to deal with the changes in geography. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the joys of being fish and fowl. And what we mean by that is we have a foot in the professional community and a lot of contacts there on how DOD and military gamers operate and how many commercial game companies operate. But we also are primarily hobbyists. So we get a little bit of attention in both ways. So this is where I want to sort of pass it back to Mark. Come on, Mark, you can come back. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> get back into this thread here. Uh, player positions and roles. Interest, uh, we're trying to organize all the parts. The, uh, we're, we're a game built around a nation cell. A nation cell, everybody's got his own unique identity, his own agenda, his own motivation, what he's fighting for. We often tell uh, a primary example, if you're the, US, the chief of naval operations, U.S. chief of naval operations, your enemy isn't Russia or Iran. Your enemy is the U.S. Air Force who's fighting for the same chunk of the budget, the same policies uh, that you that you want to move in your direction. Um, so between uh, getting all the players in the right place, we have a, we have a cell controller saying, oh, okay, well, you gather around. Now your cell itself is generally open because most on the level of geostrategic uh, uh, planning we are, most of these countries can't keep a secret that well. But there are certain, and, uh, certain times under which you're clo you will close down. Um, Map the map tools we discuss uh, to we we now we'll now have a large display in every cell room that shows exactly the same maps. They can zoom in, they can move it around, see what they want, but they can't move the units without coming to someone who has game master access, usually just me. Uh, and I can put down new units. If they want to buy a new carrier battle group, they paid for it. I can give them that carrier battle group. We'll say, where do you want to put it now? Um, we put up uh, posters that have information on it. Uh, there was a question about how uh, the people know what they need to know. Often we've, we will put informational posters up on the wall saying this is the country you are, this is what they, they make, they sell, they export, they import, these are some issues, uh, various types of other play aids. Sometimes we have that playing in PowerPoint on a loop uh, just so that they have a background. And sometimes it'll kick off some events, get them to start thinking about some of the things that they can do. Um, now, with that, we have to haul around our projection screens. Sometimes the convention says, "Okay, here's here's a projector, here's that," but we have our own uh, that after we have to go in and get set up. Uh, we have our own projectors, monitors. Uh, we, you know, we um, between Merle and me, we're probably out of pocket uh, two or three thousand dollars for office supplies every year, and we give usually prizes out to the the. Uh, uh, with the people we decide are the winners of the game. That's that's strictly subjective on the part of the control staff to say who did the best job of uh, trying to make, make their motivations work, also considering the fact that some positions are harder to play than others. Um, the prizes are usually re reasonably good books, although I won't say we didn't get them off the discount rack, uh, but off of all DVDs, Blu-rays, Blu -rays, et cetera, usually having something to do with geopolitics, history, military, whatever. Um, right now, our, our staff, we have about 40 people who will phase in or phase out depending on their schedule and they can help and their, vol their volunteers. We have, you can usually go to any of the main conventions and pull six or seven people out of the audience that we know have played 30 games or more uh, that like us and have the good background and that we've seen in operation. We know they can do the, do the job to help us facilitate. About 12 hard, hardcore staffers and six of us are as we wrote, beyond all hope, uh, we're committed to this and we'll probably be doing this until we die, drop dead. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, we we usually people feel like I said phase in phase out, but we've kept managed to keep a large core staff of people who've gone to one, uh, conventions one after another for 15 or 20 years now, and we they know they know how to run these cells and they know what's expected of them, so we can usually get get something started really a game really started really quickly that was sometimes remembering Dan and me back 25 years ago, like pulling teeth, getting everybody in the right job. Uh, now we're not sure where we're going to go. Did you want to handle this, Merle, or want me to? Well, I, I can join in. I mean, okay. right now our, our real struggle is the pros and cons of incorporation. I mean, we were incorporated at one point in the past as a not-for-profit, and we found it really didn't help us because nobody ever gave us money. Um, but now we're, we're starting to get more interest from certain academic institutions and places that want us to do things. Like we have uh, uh, Southeast uh, U.S. University asking us to run a summer camp. So that's the kind of thing where you go, well, that means you have to have a contract. And that means you really need to have a checking account that isn't a personal account and those kinds of things. So we're thinking about how to deal with that. Um, incorporating has its problems because it means you have to have a corporate structure. You have to... Uh, have policies, you get legal responsibility for your staff. Um, just visualize if you're running a mega game and you have a facilitator sexually harass a player, it wouldn't be good. And that means insurance and chain of command and commitments. And what happens if somebody gets sick? How do you cover substitutes? Because now you're a corporation. That's a real challenge. And the, the, on the other side, your loose association model, which has worked for us for 30 years, is where strange quarks attract. We've got informal leaders, a philosophy of design. We basically tell people the ground rules when they come in. We, we generally have an hour or more conversation with volunteers to say, okay, you're not a slave, you're a volunteer. We talk as a group and come up with priorities, but sometimes priorities don't get done because nobody's interested in doing it. If you're not excited about it, you're not going to do a good product. So we decide maybe we won't do that product. Um, uh, we try to get everybody thinking in the same way about philosophy of design, but not necessarily the mechanics of design. And we managed to establish a civil debating society. I mean, we have hardcore Trumpists and hardcore liberals, and we put them in other end of the table, but they stay civil. So that's a, an entirely different situation than when you have a company and now you have to sometimes enforce compliance, and we don't like that idea. So now we're pretty much an experimental hub and we've accidentally, over the years, built a brand because we've been consistent and serious enough that people know we're going to be around. And we get invited to professional venues and academic venues, and we try to do as many of those as we can. But, you know, we can't self-fund everything. Um, our, our Beyond All Hope people spend thousands of dollars on their hobby every year. And one of the things we'll talk about a little later is the joy of what I call the olive press of conventions because every convention thinks you can go there and that's the only thing you do. And if we're doing three major conventions, the, the travel and expenses gets to be a real challenge because uh, it's all self-funded. Uh, the one thing to understand is with going to incorporation and not incorporated is you know right now and for the indefinite future, there ain't no money. There are long hours to generate a quality product. And yeah, that's nice we get noticed and we have a reputation both for hobby venues and professional venues. And we're established at the biggest conventions in the country. We've never failed to hold an event, but at the same time, there ain't no money. So you're self-funding a lot of stuff. Lessons on how to run events. Oh goodness. Uh, let me answer the question here that Lee has is, where do you expect us to be 10 years from now in the future compared to now? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> um, we're a lot different now than we were 10 years ago. Our games look a lot different. Um, 10 years before that, we were different again. Um, part of what's going to drive it is the audience. Part of what's going to drive it is uh, the interests of the staff um, and the technology. It's like right now we see Online is, is the wave of the future, and one of the things we think we've learned as a lesson from running them at Dragon Con and here at OMG is that we can't design, we can't transfer the face-to-face -face game directly to online. There are going to have to be changes in the design, and it won't be the same game as we play live because the mechanics of the tools don't let us do that. 
Yeah, if nothing else, for the last few years, we've tried to avoid running the U.S. contemporary cell because uh, we're worried it'll break out in fistfights as the, uh, uh, the U.S. body politic naturally begins to assert itself. Um, there's uh, it's just so much. So we're so divided at this point. But we got plenty of other cells to run. As I mentioned, we completely revamped our China cell four years ago to be the peer uh, competitor. It's one of uh, uh, one of our player favorites, and we'll be. Uh, I already have ideas on where we're going to tweak that in the next year or two. The the, the virus has kind of put a, put a hold on our, our uh, tapping that down. But um, we're going to kind of continue to be doing that, and where where Russia is going to be moving in the next uh, next few years, we're going to have to be tracking that and updating the Russian cell because I I, I expect they're going to be more and more important on the geopolitical stage, uh, and uh, you know, there we have a lot of cells in the can that we've designed before, but we really want to brush them off and tweak on them and, and bring them up to date if we're going to run those again, and you know, that's something we something we routinely will take uh, two or three cells in any year and say, okay, how do we bring this up to date and run it again? Yeah, normally we have one new product that we try to have every year, which is either a total redesign of a current cell or a brand new cell. Like right now, we've got uh, somebody we're working with on a new Israeli cell for the contemporary era. Um, and we generally tweak and do updates on a cell that we've already got that the, the fundamentals are good, but they've had elections and they're shifts in the political parties and things like that. Um, one of the things we thought we would do at this point is sort of give you a sense of what happens at a big con for us, because we're different than, than most mega gamers in a couple of ways. One, we've moved to shorter games. The other thing is we do a lot of lectures because we take things that we learned along the way and we generally run a, a series of technology and history and poli sci and some sci-fi type lectures because we're all that geeky. And at a normal convention, our core staff is working 18 hour days most of the time. This is an example of Gen Con 2019 where we ran a four hour game in the evening Wednesday. We ran four hours of lectures in the morning on Thursday, four, eight hours, four hours of game and four hours of lectures in the afternoon. And then, uh, uh, a two-hour game, a four-hour game, and a two-hour lecture Thursday night. So you just sort of see the model of, of how much stuff we go. And sometimes we're running at Dragon Con three uh, speaking rooms at a time on occasion, or two, which is normal, just so you have a sense of what that's like. And part of the reason is that it's what I call the, the reality of conventions, and we'll talk to that in a minute. Um, this is the one thing I want to be sure Mark and I both talked about because one of the key things in our games, because we're so freestyle, is how do you deal with players, particularly players that have issues? Um, you know, we have a lot of people who've been around for a long time, who've played our mechanics, know how our games work. They also know things like a lot of world history. Those people we call sharks. Sometimes we're very careful when people come in that we'll staff an entire cell, for example, with sharks, because now they've got a higher level of competition. Sometimes if we have a lot of new people, we may make the Sharks, in terms of our casting, go into the key leadership roles and we tell them, okay, we're not going to let you win and you're okay with that because you just want to play, right? And they nod. And then their job is to help teach the new players how to play. The thing you have to watch is over time, you get to know your audience and your players. So you have to be careful that the dominant players don't eliminate the fun factor and that the wacko players don't eliminate the fun factor. We've had one player that came for years that every game you gave him a role, no matter what it was, he became a terrorist. If you gave him a communications role in a country, he would bomb his own TV stations, raise charitable money, and go put out Mujahideen. You know, it's just that every game you knew that was the way it was going to go. So you 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 had things you had to accommodate. Uh, so I, I used to call that the the random dingbat syndrome. Sometimes when you give a card that gives somebody too much personal authority that he doesn't need to, there's no checks and balances, nobody has to ch ch check him, um, then uh, things can go wild. We used to, in fact, as uh, hand out a card, okay, you're now Belgium, you are this, and uh, one player, one cell, and do this with it, and it, it, it generated too many random dingbats. Uh, but my rule now is you don't, we don't give a whole lot of power to any single person, try to split it to at least three people, so that uh, you usually have two reasonable people that could talk talk the other down off the ledge. But go ahead, Merle. Um, 
So the other thing that we have to watch is sometimes you'll have a player that what they want to do is monopolize the staff and think they're going to have face time for the win. Um, that happens in some cases, generally when you get precocious teenagers, but not always. Um, and they will have someone that, that comes back and asks question after question or says, what about this? Or what about this? Or if I try this plan instead of that plan. Uh, generally, when that happens, we assign a facilitator that's normally not that busy, and we have them just deal with that player consistently. Not that that, and that keeps it from affecting play adversely. Um, in some cases, we have been known to turn those players into semi-staffers. And we've done that both with sharks to, to see that gameplay works well, but we also do that sometimes with problem children, because if you give them a carefully defined job, your job is to make sure that we know anybody who's working on a secret conspiracy to destroy the world, they will take that on with both hands and they will keep, and by doing that, you kept them from destroying your game. Um, the other thing that you have to be aware of, and we're very sensitive to, is people that have different sensitivities. Um, we have routinely, particularly at Dragon Con, because it's so huge, dealt with impaired people, people that are high, drunk, and overtired. Um, you'll find people who are challenged by hearing and mobility and age issues. So we are, sometimes we'll make accommodations in casting. Um, for example, we have one lady that comes and visits every year that's mostly blind and has got hearing impairment. So she generally winds up with some kind of a role where everybody comes to her to talk rather than her winding, trying to wind her way through the crowd. Um, you'll also have some people that are overwhelmed. Um, we started adding briefing slides about intensity and about coming to the staff if things are getting too heavy because our games, like mega games, are very visceral and emotional. And because it's got a lot of negotiation, if things are going badly, things can go very badly. Uh, I remember very distinctly one year when I spent 15 minutes talking this one lady off what I thought was the ledge because she was crying and terribly upset. She had a, a role where she didn't understand well how to play. A bunch of people ganged up on her, and she felt verbally and physically assaulted even though she was never touched. So it has an emotional impact. And one of the jobs of the game director is to watch everybody for that kind of thing and intervene early rather than late. Those are incredibly important things for mega gamers as well as our game, because that's the kind of thing that not only ruins your reputation, but it has problems for the people. They may be in trouble that you don't realize when they walk out of the door. And we don't want anybody to really have an adverse effect from the emotional impact of a game. Um, the other thing that we have to be prepared for is dropouts during the game. I mean, we're at walk-up events. I mean, we, we have pre-registration, but if we're at Gen Con, for example, we'll have 70 people registered and 50 will show up that are registered, and then another 20 show up or, or 30. And, you know, in the middle of the game, statistically, we lose about five out of every 100 players. And at any one convention, we service 600 people, either in games or games and lectures. So it happens a lot. Um, sometimes it can have a serious impact and you might have to think about recasting people in the middle of the game or turning facilitators into players to keep it running. We had one game at Dragon Con where one girl came in, she played for half the game, then passed out because she was drunk and her and her four friends left all as a block because they were taking care of her. Um, that's a critical problem. This is the one you need to cover, Mark. Okay, yeah. Um, increasingly, uh, the big cons uh, are, are more about the money rather than the games. They're less. They're uh, they are asking more and more hours from us. They're giving us less and less benefits. It used to be back in the '90s when we first put together a formal staff, and uh, you know, my bro my brother and I would negotiate with the conventions, and they would give us. Uh, four double occupancy rooms in a hotel adjacent to the convention, uh, two round trip plane tickets, and $200 discretionary money for us to spend on uh, whatever while we're there, and as well as, as free as free tickets for the entire staff. Now we get the free tickets because that's free for them. We're all we're you know, some of these conventions that cut us down to one hotel room uh, or no hotel rooms, and we have to charge an excess fee. Uh, that they so they send us the money we buy our, our hotel room, which means essentially we've just raised our prices. We're not getting anything we weren't getting before, except we're now assuming the risk 
that we didn't have before. Uh, we, you know, we gave up the round trip airfare a long time ago. That didn't mean anything to me. Uh, but we were, we tried to negotiate that away to, to try to continue to get the hotel rooms. And now those are getting, uh, getting drawn away. So, um, it's becoming a challenge now dealing with some of the, some of the staffs. Um, this in the financial impact has been, been, uh, great, uh, greater on, on many of us. Uh, now there, uh, as far as, over the years, we've dealt with some good management teams, some poor management teams, where there are always program or event errors, how we deal with that and what we need to do. Our first set of posters, I talked about our, us putting posters together in 1999, I think was our first big posters we put together at Origins, because after about three years of less and less and less advertising among Origins, uh, we were sitting there Wednesday night before the convention started wondering, nobody is going to know that we are here. We're not in the program book. Uh, we're not online. We're not anywhere. And anybody is going to come to our games because they they know we've been here years before, and this is where we usually go. So maybe they might come and find us. But there was no way for anybody to know we were there, as far as the origin staff. But one of the problems is that we don't fit into a lot of cat and night the nice neat categories there used to be. That they know where to put us in the game book if we were an RPG, if we were a LARP, if we were a board game. We don't fit into any of those categories nice and neatly. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to say that we're a live action role playing game, uh, in, in meeting most, uh, most techniques of that, most, uh, most definitions of that. My brother was always a little bit concerned with, concerned with that, uh, that label, but we, uh, I could tell a lot of these conventions we didn't get in the program book because they deferred trying to figure out who we were till they could figure out you know, to where they put us till they could figure out where we were. And then that decision never went, never got made before the program went, book went to it. So we started to make the posters. We started to put up other forms of advertising, things like that, all to try to make up for the, um, uh, the in inaccuracies of these conventions. Um, another routine problem we've had at these conventions is that uh, someone will go up to, to the desk to try to get the ticket, and they didn't know, they don't, don't understand or aren't willing, able to deal with a, a game group that says, we will take as many players as you send us. If you, if you get 200 players, we have 200 positions, that would be, you know, throw me into that briar patch. I'd love to try it. Uh, but we uh, we say keep them coming, but they don't know how to deal with that. So offhand they said, okay, well we'll make three tickets. And they printed three tickets, and after they sold three tickets. They said tell people, oh we're sold out. We have to keep telling everybody who knows us we are never sold out. Keep coming, uh, we will find a place for you. And our veterans know that. But anybody who wanted to try us out after they sold three tickets already said, oh well I was told you sold out, so I couldn't try your game. We're never sold out. Uh, we will always find a place for anybody who wants to show up. The, the other thing um, that gets us there is the issue with the conventions often gauge you based on your fill rate. If you said you're going to fill 20 seats and you fill 18, that's an issue. If you say I can fill unlimited, then you're always like 30% of unlimited. No, and you're less than that. So they say you don't perform very well because the one thing that really has come true with any convention of more than 10,000 people, maybe even smaller than that, is big cons are not about games anymore. They're game. They're, they're all about money. It's all about making a profit for the space and the entertainment dollar that they're presenting. And Gen Con in particular, that's become very harsh. And Origin in particular, that's become very harsh. So it's what I call the olive press. Every year they ask for more and more and you get less and less. And to go to multiple cons like we do, instead of just featuring one con, Everybody on staff pays their food. They pay their hotel. You know, if we don't have hotel space for everybody, there's all the expenses of, yeah, I want to go and shop in the vendor hall too, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it becomes a big deal when you've got a convention in a high cost area like Atlanta. Rooms are three and $400 a night. Um, you know, parking is like $50 a night in some places. It's incredibly expensive. And being established at the big cons is a benefit, but it's also a penalty. <laughs> okay. So one of the responses was we did posters. And before the days of electronics, we did wall posters. So we'd sneak into the bathrooms and put up stuff with tacky tape or painter's tape. And then there was always the issue every con and every site would have different rules about what you could post. We did oversized signs that were four feet by like three feet. Um, we had t-shirts and mugs for a while and we found out that just wasn't economic because we were carrying too, stuff, too much stuff. And 
We wound up doing postcards where one side's a cool picture, like saving throws in SDM style, which you see in the corner, and the back side's our schedule. And we tossed those out on every table that we would see. Uh, Dan was particularly good at trying to smooch with uh, with convention management. He'd go and see the managers and give them the T-shirt and talk them up. And he'd be gone for a good chunk of many games because he was busy <laughs> trying to ensure we could come back. Um, and then we've started a mailing list. We ask people for their emails at the conventions, and we let them know whenever we're doing stuff. And now we're doing that with Facebook. But that was part of the way we responded. And fortunately, our big signs are still accepted at Origins, even though no other gaming group is allowed to put them up. And at Gen Con, nobody can do signs except outside your immediate room. And at Dragon Con, you can do signs outside your immediate room and no place else. So we've got official logos. We're now on our third official logo. The last one that we've got is professionally designed. Um, and I guess I can pop it up here in the corner so you can see it again. That was done by a university group for us, and uh, that's our third logo ever. Uh, we do big posters. This is our Cold War poster. And one year at Origins, they had this really nice general sign, which is like, you know, neck high. And we've carried that around for years, and that's now become a trademark. I'm still not sure who the artist was that did it for Origins, but it's not copyrighted as far as we can tell. We've been using it now for years. Um, we've also got stand up, uh, build up, stand up signs. So that, makes a big difference in you being noticed. And what we often have found is people said, I've seen your signs for years and I've never gotten to play. And finally I decided to come in. So aggregate over time, that was really good for our brand, but on any given year, you didn't see it. Um, future challenges. I'll let you kick this one, Mark. Uh, yeah, we've uh, origins went through a very slow period uh, for a few years. Uh, we can go into why, but I'd rather not. Uh, but we our, our numbers are down. We've had a few of our staff say they will never go back to Origins again uh, because of the way they were treated that way back when. Now there's a new management staff. Maybe we'll be able to coax them back. But for what it's worth, our uh, we uh, we contracted our program at Origins based on the number of numbers of people we were getting as players and the numbers of staff we had. Uh, we're work, going to be working on try to revitalize that, revive ourselves at Origins. Uh, Gen Con, we've been moved around, shuffled from one place to another at Gen Con. That's hurt our numbers. Our largest numbers ever were in 2015. We got moved to a new place when the uh, um, hotel were revamping the rooms that we'd been in for about 10 years. We were moved where I consider to be off-site. They, Gen Con says, oh, no, that's right, core. Well, we were right in the core, and we were moved a few blocks out, and our numbers dropped precipitously and continued to drop. We started to re respond with an additional additional online campaigns, started our player list, try and do more and more on our part to try to make up for advertising we weren't getting. Uh, but we are we hope to try to, uh, our numbers are back on the rise as far as 2019 in Gen Con. We did uh, a sizable lecture series online at Gen Con this year, because the you know, Gen Con was, on, was online just to keep our foot in the door and uh, let them know we, we are interested and we are trying to contribute to their program. Uh, we, and we did a few things at Hope that we thought would have helped us out at Gen Con this, with our numbers at Gen Con this year. Last year was our worst year in many, many years since we started tracking. Um, so we, we don't know if that was, was going to work or not. The COVID-19 virus put, uh, stopped everything as far as uh, that momentum went, but we'll see how things work out next year. Um, Dragon Con has been our success story. We enjoy Dragon Con. They like us. We get the advertising we need. We get the spaces we need there. And um, uh, our, our our lecture series, especially, we have we had a number of lectures last year. Dragon Con drew over 100 people. One that drew over 200 people. Uh, and our conventions keep expanding. Uh, this our our games keep expanding at Dragon Con. So we want to we want to ride that wave for as long as we can. Uh, Dragon Con <laughs> might be the only place we're going to be going in, in, a, in a few more years with the trends that uh, Gen Con and Origins continue. Um, now, we find also at some of these ventures, especially Dragon Con, science fiction and uh, futuristic scenarios are, are more popular. We certainly want to play to the crowd, uh, give them what they want. Uh, I, I'm interested in trying to revive some type of economic play. Uh, whether we bring back policy and budget sheets or not, uh, that's that's another question. But we want we want to do something that streamlines 
and makes it, you know, tries to make it more fun and, more, and possibly some online resources. And I'll approach them might be the way to do that. Um, a lot of interesting. One question: Do we want the major powers, the great powers? Do we want, or do we want small countries? There are a lot of interesting play to be had with nations like Pakistan, France, Iran, um, Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia not a small country, but in, in terms of the influence of a Russia or a China or a United States, it is. So uh, it's it's some um, it's interesting on our part to design those and a lot of fun to be had. But we usually end up having to teach a lot of players about something, which has its advantages, has its disadvantages. Uh, now, contemporary controversies, uh, there are risks running running some cells. Uh, uh, we find a lot of players like the bad guys. A lot of players. Say when we say okay, we'll be running um, U.S., North Korea, and France in this cell. And, oh, I want to be in North Korea, or I want to be in Iran. Uh, but there's there's some sensitivities. We are running a uh, running a series of games uh, in Central New Jersey, uh, and there was you know, half half the players were Jewish, and we but the only cell we had that can run was small turnout. The only play, cell we can run. That with as few players as turned out for the game was Iran. <laughs> After a few games, can we not run Iran again? Uh, they found that there's the sensitivities uh, with regard to, try, to trying to do that, and so uh, there might be some problems there. Um, we we're getting more pressure from conventions to run shorter games. I don't know if it says something about the attention span of Americans today, but but we've been been running more two-hour games. Those are focused crisis games, so it's oh, they're somewhere off from our brand, which allows you to do everything, anything you want to, anything that you have the time to do. It can convince all the other players to go along with versus something that's very scripted. Uh, so we're uh, they're also difficult to run. We have to put together the inject list and put together a scenario and make make it all sensible and train our entire staff on what it is we're going to do and then keep keep the pressure up, keep those running. So so those are difficult to meant to put together and to run, whereas uh another fast play game, another four hour fast play game, it's the positions, not the scenario. Uh so we have to think what we're gonna do. Go ahead. The other thing I would point out with the two hour crisis games is We've found a couple of key elements. One is uh, it takes as much uh, out of the staff to run a two-hour game as it does take a four-hour game. They tend to be much more intense. We have to have lots more of injects, and it's the players reacting to the injects, which tends to make the games very international and have almost no domestic play. Um, part of our, our vision of our brand is that countries we play have internal and external conflict, there's no internal conflict because there's no time. It's always focused around some key event, whether it's you know North Korea invaded South Korea or something else. There's always some key international event that generally has to trigger it. And it is extremely intense because of that. And it gets as well attended as a four hour game. But when the conventions count credit, a two hour game isn't an advantage to us most of the time because we've got the same number of people in the game and it actually wipes out the staff worse. So if we did two back-to-back -back two hours, we're, we're all dragging and ready to fall over. And if we do one four-hour, it's not so bad. Yeah, now if we can get 50 people in each of two hour two two-hour games, uh, this uh, an attraction, a desire to do that versus uh, a four-hour game that draws 25 people. Uh, so yep. it, it's it's where where we need to go with things to try to try to appease the appease the audience. It's just the difficult. The other to do. thing being at a big con, and we have a good percentage of walk-ins. I mean, at most conventions, at least thirty percent of the players are people who didn't pre-register. Okay, they come in with generic tickets. So you know what that drives is an entirely different um, way of trying to assess. I mean, mega games generally have people who knew about the mega game long before the convention. They come just for the mega game and they spot that time out. And what we've found is that the large conventions have become more and more cornucopia of things that people can do. When it comes to pre-reg, we're competing with that audience because even though we've got followers, you know, we've got to the point where the people who were regulars 10 years ago are not the regulars now because they died or had life changes. Like they got married or got kids or lost their job or something like that. So that really changes the environment. So the next thing is things we're working on development. Um, you all have seen where we're trying to do something with discord. We just started a YouTube channel in the last two months or so. 
We now have about 15 broadcasts, so we're broadcasting all of our seminars. We haven't yet got to the point where we figured out if we want to do that with games if we go back to live. Uh, we're also going to build a European-style mega game for Escape Velocity, which we'll talk about. Uh, well, I guess I should talk about now. Escape Velocity is a Washington, D.C.-based science fiction con that uh, we've been going to now for two years. This will be our third. They're going online, and they're going to try a different model to do evenings and weekends. So we don't know their schedule yet, but it's going to be in October and November. So if you're interested, watch our Facebook page. And we will do a traditional you know, European-style mega game where you have cells that look pretty much the same. There'll be common mechanics. There'll be advancement tracks and things like that. And we're going to try to do that on Discord. Uh, that's our, our September-October development. Um, we're continuing to work on mid-1980s Cold War games because we wanted to be able to do something uh, during the period of Able Archer and when both the U.S. and the Soviet Union had lots of military options. We've also been doing a lot more solicitation and discussion with academic venues. Um, we've even thought about running our own conventions or events. Um, the problem there is because where our audience is people that come to the big cons, they're from all over. And if you have one in the Midwest, there's all kinds of people that can't come. So when we've done surveys, we have 20 people say they could come to a, a physical convention if we took over a hotel for a weekend instead of 80 people that come to a con. Uh, we also have the issue of what new nations to work on for cells. Uh, we'd love to do Brazil. We've talked about it for years, but we can't figure out how to educate players in a four-hour game and then play Brazil because it's complicated. Uh, but we probably are going to be able to develop a new Israeli cell. So that, that's another piece of the future. So we promised to show you some of our old tools. This is some of our old maps. Uh, you can see that a lot of these were the old ONC aerial maps. Uh, or big world maps, and we'd photocopy them to blow them up. We had some that had been hand-drawn and laminated, and we were using Post-its. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk more about how you were doing this, but you talked about folding up the foam core and taping it up solid every time. Yeah, we this, this, was, this, was an, this was an interim before I made the, made the big foam cores, but um, as you can see, um, on the left side, that's a Cold War game, and you can see U.S. and Soviet bombers lining up on each side. You can see some target uh, fa fail-safe points, if you've ever seen the movie Fail-safe, where they're supposed to head to on alert, and that's what we simulated with that. I, I enjoy, having lived through this period, having been on um, a bliss missile submarine patrols during the Cold War and back in the 80s, I like to take teenagers and 20-somethings and show them this polar map with the bombers and the missiles lined up and how close the U.S. and the Soviet Union really were to each other and how, how, how short, a, short a, it would, would have been uh, the travel time for nuclear war. Um, on the right side, you see some um, just uh, labels and markers they put on generic white post-its, uh, generic yellow post-its, and that's I could put together. I had a, a spreadsheet I could put in a, a few numbers of uh, how many armored vehicles, what their size of their army is, what size, how many aircraft, combat aircraft they had, and how many ships they have. And it will put out, it will then tell me what the exact unit uh, you know, unit layout is that I need to create. I could put, uh, take a country that we hadn't, any, we had not thought of fighting over, but the players decided they wanted to, and put up their order of battle in about eight minutes. Um, that's, uh, I, I was, I was rather, rather happy to be doing that, but the rest are printed on regular post-its. Uh, I gave up on the specialized markers I was using, just using post-it glue on the back. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's easy to do. And I did this for, for a while, but I, I found, like I said, it would take about eight or 10 hours of time to start putting these things up on these maps. And I eventually made foam cord maps that I talked about. Two of them that are each three three by four foot. So I had a six by a four foot by six foot Mercator projection that I had um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these markers up on. And at the end of the game, end of the convention, I can move everything back to where it was. I could fold them up, tape them, and stick them off in, in Merle's van. They're actually, two sets: one Cold War and one Contemporary, and just bring out the next convention. Saved a lot of time. We're up and up and moving very very rapidly. So we got uh, now. A now uh, Leslie's asking, do we find younger people are now interested in playing with our games? If yes, what draws them in? If, if not, why do you think they aren't drawn? And the answer is, heck yeah. Uh, we've got tons more young people playing than ever before. Um, you know, when we first started this process, and Mark can speak to part of it better, but I started playing in the mid-90s, 
about a third of the people that came were veterans and the rest of them were historical gamers at most of the cons because that was the gaming track even at gen con back in those days um as we moved towards the 2000s and particularly after we passed 2010 and 2013 i think it's the first year we were or 12 was the year we were back at dragon con consistently because we'd intermittently been at dragon con before that but now we've been back for like seven or eight years uh and they they're really proud to have us there because they like the diversity we're seeing lots more young people the average age of players is now probably just under 30. Uh, we have uh, always had some younger people come in, generally people that have gifted children. Like we have some players that started with us when they were in third grade and are now going into college. Their mom used to come in the first game she sat through and watched us. And now she just drops them off and hugs us hello and goodbye. Um, you know, and they always come in in their steampunk costumes. I mean, ever since they were little, you know. Um, but yeah, we're getting lots more role players, a uh, lot less serious history people. And generally what draws people in is word of mouth more than anything else. Our advertising and signs helped where we could do that, but we're less able to do that now than ever. I mean, Gen Con even got to the point where they want to charge you to put a sign in the hallways or to be promoted on any of their official events. You have to pay them for space. And Origins was doing some of that, but we were sort of an exception because we were legacy. Um, but word of mouth is the big thing because people hear about it and they 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 just they love it. Now Lee has a question. Have we tried multi-sessions? Yes, we have. Um, we have done games both in normal context and in others. Like we had one game where the players were we had enough people to play one cell. We had a large North Korean cell. And every few minutes, they, they screamed the five-minute hate about how they were going to invade the South and destroy the world and take over. And the South knew they were coming. So about halfway through the game, they launched the invasion. Everybody knew they were coming. They were devastatedly, just devastatingly defeated. So we broke for lunch because that was an eight-hour game. When they came back, we made them the U.S. Congress, and they had to deal with the mess. Um, we've also had games where the result of the first game was the beginning of the world in the second game. So like we'd play a contemporary game at, at Dragon Con and then we do our near future game where the geography and the balance of power changed based on what occurred in the first game. And we've done that about a half a dozen times where we've had the events of the first one bleed into the second. Yeah, but, uh, but to, get to to respond to to Lee's question, uh, we don't. We try not to. We, we're we're scared. We uh, we usually don't get uh, anywhere near the same players group, uh, back next game as the, as the last game. So we can't really run a scenario over two days because we're going to get a different set of people. Uh, so that's that's something we we tried to shy shy away from doing. We have we have as Merle pointed out taken. We ran a game down at Fort Benning, for example, beginning uh, last year, and it was a Cuban Missile Crisis game, and they ended up with some some unusual results that involved tactical nuclear weapons use. Uh, and we've used that as a starting point in a lot of our 1960 games last year, uh, saying, okay, it's it, this is what happened to Cuban Missile Crisis, and. Uh, it was it was just so interesting the way that they had left the U.S. and the Soviet cells. So we had to brief them on how that game ended. But we used that as a starting point. But no, we don't we don't say okay, we're going to be running this game in two parts here today and the next day unless we have some assurance that we're going to have largely the same bulk of people. And that's never that's never the case. Now it could have been a different situation in some of the cons because for a number of years we were going to the historical miniature gaming society cons and drawing 35 or 40 people, which was remarkable because that's a 2,700 person con compared to 10,000 plus for Origins to 17,000 to like 60,000 or 80,000 at Gen Con and 80,000 to 90,000 at Dragon Con. I mean, we've always appealed to a slice of the, the people that come, but at some place like uh, the HMGS cons, the people that would come from day to day were pretty much the same guys because over half of them would be the same because we had some college kids in Pennsylvania that were coming to one of the cons and they came for five or six years as a group. So that had a, a significant impact. Um, so to show you some of the other stuff, uh, we've also done a lot of different kind of play aids. This Merle, was- uh, can I, Merle, can I, yeah. can I suggest we go to my screen just to show them what the mill map tool shows? Absolutely, does? absolutely. Let, let me go back one here. Okay, and then we, uh, we, we went, went from these maps- 
This is the old way. Got that? This is the new way. This is what we do now. This is a military map. It's fully web uh, web designed, so we we will have six. We could have an unlimited number of these displays up on monitors throughout the convention. Every cell would ideally get its own monitor, and they, um, as a player, they can zoom in and see how the world looks, various places. Uh, and as game master myself and a few other places, we could actually start moving things, and uh, they will be you know, fully web enabled. It will that movement will then be shown in every cell in every room uh and i can in fact do something like this always a lot of fun and when i press press control f every screen suddenly and every room suddenly shifts to the view that i'm looking at at that particular moment and that's what uh, i've had a lot of fun saying let me do this and see what type of expletives i'm going to hear over the next few minutes uh but uh i can generate uh any type of uh, any type of order battle in a large number of units that can be uh, put together and it's very very flexible and it's uh, it's very fast to set up and i can do a whole lot of things uh very easily and, uh, and every player gets to see it everywhere immediately it's linked to our new speed inject system so i can move quickly between this and making a vis a verbal description a text description and transmitting that to everybody of what exactly they're looking at and what it means the other thing to note is, you know, we've talked about this, but I want to be sure I foot stomp it, is all of our um, results are adjudication. They're based on the skill of the staff. So there's no combat table to this. What we were basically doing is we've done the research on order of battle, and we periodically every couple of years update it to show the relative size of forces. But the adjudication of results can change based on technologies players develop during the game, approaches and redeployments that they do during the game. Uh, we've, done games, we've done games <laughs> with asteroid impacts. We've done games with new technologies like laser equipped aircraft or anti-aircraft systems because like the futures games and the near future games, we're trying to explore and let people think about the impact of this new thing that people have tried to do. Mark, will you do a really good close-up of Europe? I want them to see the granularity of that for something like the the Ruhr, uh, German-French border. Yeah, a little but bit. This is, this is contemporary. Yeah. So you can see this is a thing that helps people visualize relative forces, but we haven't forced them into a block. Just like the guys from Mega Gamers talk about, you know, we realize that traditional models of, you know, three to one and four to one and all that kind of stuff isn't necessarily the way things work. Uh, and we, we try to include that. You can, I can mouse over this and uh, we could see what the thing is. Uh, I can, I'm happy to, uh, if, if you, if you want to break a division out of a core, I, mean, I can, I can break the division up into a core. Um, as you can see, we try to keep things contemporary. We have a, Spez, a Russian Spesnaz unit in across the border in the Ukraine, uh, and uh, we have the Russian problems in Chechnya. So the other thing to bring out with all of this is, you know, this is where our ability to manipulate time in the game has a big impact. Because if there's a military crisis, we slow time down. Generally, what that does is that means the players who aren't directly involved in the military are still busy working on negotiating with other players to achieve their internal goals or their goals with countries not involved in the conflict. And what we find is that once you get about halfway or a third of the way into a four-hour game, a lot of the player activity is all based on players approaching other players with ideas. So to a large degree, they become self-entertaining. And one of the things we wind up doing is changing the pace of game inserts so that we don't overload them. Because if they're already doing lots of stuff, you know, we're not trying to give them too much. Now, one of the things we do try to do in the, the flux of the game is when we reach about the 80% or 85% or point in the game, we try to give them a significant event that they can focus on that helps make the game memorable, but which they still can influence or change. So maybe our storyline is a resurgent Iran, and this is the large arc. And the, the Russians are in play, and the US is in play, and they're doing different things. And now they, you get to the end event. The end event might be Iran invades Iraq. How are you all going to deal with that? 
Okay, that's something neither one of them had direct control over. It doesn't force them to do or not do anything specific, but it gives them something memorable. Like, oh, I remember that. And then we went forth and did this, and we did this, and we did this, and all oh, that was so cool because there is that cool factor to gameplay. So I'm going to take that one off and take us back to the other. Um, so this is to give you a sense of how we've evolved because when it first started, it was big maps that had no markers. And we had laminated maps and, and wall maps of the U.S. and stuff like that. Then we moved to the system where we used maps with post-its, and we wound up normally making photocopy ex and expansions and blow-ups of, of stuff. And then as you move further on, we started making more play aids. And this shows some of the differences we went through over time. This particular set that you see here is where we were designing a U.S. cell and running almost 50 players in it, and we had party factions within each party, and the nominating conventions were a big part of the game, and we were tracking voting strength by area. So that's one of the things we experimented with. It was a lot of fun, but it had its limits, and we sort of moved past that. Uh, nowadays, we also are doing play aids that are visuals for the different cells on how things work, and that seems to help with the explanation time and the fact they have a reference. So this is the set we've got for Russia. We've done this for a few cells. We'd love to do it for all of them, but staff time has influenced that a little bit, so we don't have them for every cell. Um, the other thing that we've talked around, but I want to be clear on, we have modeled 23 nations in the modern world, of which we have about seven right now that are suitable for play and are current enough. You know, we talked about how we tweak some and we try to get a new one every year. The Cold War, we're up to seven different countries we can run, and that's nice because the countries generally don't change. The only thing that changes is if we learn new history and decide to revise it based on that, so it's more accurate. Um, we've also found that we have a lot of popularity from doing our science fiction and near future games, and we started doing that for Dragon Con, and now that's pretty much something that we have a, a subset of our players that look forward to every year now. So we have to run at least one near future game or science fiction type game. Um, you know, so this sort of gives you a sense. And part of the reason they aren't all valid is these people think that they can have changes in their political parties and their leadership and their processes. It's like we've had two or three different models for South Korea. And South Korea, the parties change almost every election in major ways. So we've only had like a couple of versions. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's, that's Mark's response to the custom-based software. Um, now, this is actually um, a software that's uh, open source. And if you send us a note, I put a note I can on Facebook. I can put you in touch with our web developer, uh, the guy that's, that works on this. Uh, he's done some custom mods, but it has its pluses and minuses. It's just something we could afford to get, and we had an expert to do it. So, you know, again, one of the problems is you have goals uh, of things you want to be able to do, and you don't have the resources to do it all. And with volunteers, the rule is. They have to be angry enough about the way you're doing it that they want to change it or excited enough that they want to do something new. And if you don't have one of those two things, it doesn't happen. So essentially, if it's not one of those two things, Mark and I wind up doing it, <laughs> 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 which leads to certain kinds of plot complications. But fortunately, the kids are all grown now. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is the folks that have been speaking. So we've had uh, a Mark from, from our staff and one of the co-founders. And then, of course, we've got me, who I'm now the lead cat herder, uh, and do most of the designs. Probably 60% of our NSDM designs are ones I've done. Um, but we have other staff that have done them pretty much on their own and done a really nice job. Um, so anybody else have questions? Uh, we also like to promote the fact that if you're interested, uh, you can work long hours for no pay and hang out with our staff, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll gladly accept help. Um, we'll give it another minute or two for questions. Mark, is there anything else you want to foot stop, stop from I this? I just session? want to point out I have entirely too much fun with our, my green screen feature in StreamYard here. <laughs> yeah. Not really, as, really, not really as cold as it looks. Yeah, I really like StreamYard, too, because I can do things like this. Yes, that's me. Okay. Uh, but we've had a lot of fun with that over the, the time we've been experimenting. 
So I don't see any more questions on Discord. I don't see any more questions from Facebook or YouTube. So we want to thank you all for joining us. We hope that it was useful to you. Uh, I'm going to go over and hang out in the con panel questions area. And if I can persuade Mark to do that, he'll come over too. So if we want to have a conversation uh, or answer questions there. So thank you all again. We appreciate you. Thank you for inviting us to OMG Con. Uh, we've enjoyed being here. So we're going to end the broadcast.